Yeah. Morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Happy daylight savings time day. I'm sure we're all bright eyed and bushy tail for a music lecture today. Um, so, today I want to begin with just a very brief overview of our composer for today and for next Sunday, John Rutter, who wrote the Requiem that we're going to perform next week in its entirety, and uh, what we did one movement of today, and we're going to get into the weeds, as it were, with one other movement, so that I hope, hopefully, you'll find this interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. Um, so, just for those of you who have not done the Requiem scene here at St. Elizabeth's, we do one of these every year, a week before Palm Sunday. And it just, it's been a tradition since I arrived here 20 years ago. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes. I need a big sash or something. Um, actually, I need a hospital. Um, so, we do this, and, and so the Requiem is really a musical setting of what used to be strictly the Mass for the Dead, the Catholic Mass of it. So the texts were originally taken from that. Um, what you're going to hear today, and especially in its entirety next week, is a very different experience, and we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, the Rudder Requiem was written by John Rudder. He was born in 1945. He is a very successful, prolific composer that's still alive. And um, he was educated in Cambridge, England at Clare College. He was the music director at his alma mater from 1975 to 1979. He founded the Cambridge Singers, for those of you who are geeky enough to know these types of groups. And it's an excellent choral group. There are sheets of paper for you. How can I leave you out? Here we go. Sure. Sorry to interrupt. Um, and he founded the Cambridge Singers in 81 after he left the music department at his alma mater. And then a few years later, his father died in 1984. And a year after that, he finished composing the piece that you will hear next week. And um, I want to just mention a couple of very important influences and in how this makes a work like this more unique than, let's say, the Mozart Requiem or many of the other Requiems that we have done here that are from a more distant past. By the time Brahms wrote his Requiem, and for a, there was a major change in composer's choice of texts. This is an important development. What they chose to set their music to was no longer prescribed by this Mass for the Dead, this Catholic Mass. And so they started picking texts that were outside the box. And that's a big change. And foray of which John Rutter actually edited the edition that we've performed here, was very, very interested in this work. And there are certain characteristics, not only about doing choosing texts that were not as prescribed as the ones from the more distant past, but also musical choices as well. And I would say a more optimistic view of death than the sort of hellfire and damnation type requiems that we get um, from these more distant past requiems. This one um, has seven movements to it, and there is an arc to this structure, and it, I just am going to mention this briefly, and these are his words. The first and last, last movements are prayers on behalf of all humanity. So, the Requiem Aeternum, movement one, and 
the Lux Eterna movement seven um, will use both Latin and English texts. So there is that, which is also more of a contemporary change. Instead of sticking with only the Latin text, you get both. And, some, and it's not necessarily a translation of what you have just heard, but he's mixing the two texts together. We get two psalms that he sets. One you heard at church today in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The other one is the one that you're going to hear now, which is Psalm 130, out of the deep. Um, in the middle, movements three and five, well, not the dead center, the P.A. Yesu and the Agnus Dei, he considers personal prayers to Christ. Those texts, he struck him as that. And the Sanctus, which we did today, um, he just, he did, that's sort of like the, almost the midpoint of the piece, and it's an affirmation of divine glory. Holy, holy Lord God. Just those words that we sing all the time. But th that will be in a Latin text. So that's the overview of this. The quote from him, which I think is important, is something I want to read to you. The Requiem was written in 1985 and dedicated to the memory of my father who had died the previous year. In writing it, I was influenced and inspired by the example of Faure. I doubt whether any specific musical resemblances can be traced, but I'm sure that Faure's Requiem crystallized my thoughts about the kind of Requiem I wanted to write. Intimate rather than grandiose, contemplative and lyric rather than dramatic. I, you better not say that that's entirely true. It's dramatic. <laughs> and ultimately moving towards light rather than darkness. The lux eterna of the closing text. So I wanted to share that with you. I think that's really important. Um, before we start doing some music, can you take out the sheets that you all have? Does anyone not have a sheet? If you don't, there are copies um, on the round table. Or there used to be. Uh, they're over there. Okay, thank you. Um, we're not going to restart read this responsibly or by half first, I promise. <laughs> um, but I actually want you all to read this together with me. Can we do that? And it'll be the top version of it, not the one with all of the bold face stuff that's coming. Okay, everyone together. Out of the deep have I called unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. O let thy ears consider well the voice of my complaint. If thou, Lord, wilt be extreme to mark what is done in this, O Lord, who may abide it? For there is mercy with thee, therefore shalt thou be feared. I look for the Lord, my soul doth wait for him. And in his word is my trust. My soul fleeth unto the Lord before the morning watch. I say before the morning watch. O Israel, trust in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his sins. Okay, so... This, the Latin term for this psalm, De Profundis, as you can see, means out of the depths. That's the more literal translation, and then parenthetically, out of the depths of sorrow or despair. I have the same text printed just below this, but you'll notice that a number of the words are highlighted. I highlighted them because this is what he did in this movement. These are the words that he emphasizes, and the way he goes about doing that is what we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, if you could look down at the bottom, you're going to see three musical terms, the blue scale, chromatic scale, Bolivian mode. Um, and I'm going to go over to the piano. So just to get your ears sort of wrapped around this, this is a modern composer. This is a guy that writes in a classical tradition, in an Anglican tradition. There's certain melodies and chord changes. Religion, 
chant, even, he draws upon in this. But he also has more modern ideas. And of course, if you hear the blues scale, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this, you would go, well, that seems a little odd for like a classical piece of music. But it isn't, because that's what's going on. It's been going on for decades now. Think of George Gershwin, who tried to like convince people that he was a serious composer with the Rhapsody in Blue and the Concerto in F in America in Paris. It's all blues. It's all there, and it goes back to the 20s. So that's, that's more or less where that started, that fusion of styles that comes together. But look at this text. Of course you would write a blues for this. Despair? I mean, what better scale system than to stick that in a piece of music like this? So what I want you to first hear is a standard major scale. It sounds like this. Here's C major. Okay. Now, if you notice on the sheet, it says flat three, flat five, flat seven. That means the third step, the fifth step, and the seventh step of those seven notes, eight notes that I played for you, are down a half step. Instead of... So, it could be slurred. I could do the lower one or the upper one. That's the five. And there's the seven. Okay, you know that. Yeah. Chromatic scale, that's every note before you repeat a note. That's every note. And chromaticism is when a composer uses that half step to drop down or, or go up by half steps. That breaks the major minor thing because you're doing all of the notes. It's not just those that are prescribed with the major or minor scale. And then finally, Lydian. So it's a Greek word, but it's but it, it's, I actually was really shocked to, to, to hear what an actual Greek Lydian mode sounds like. It doesn't sound anything like what it's called. Um, what happened was, in the Middle Ages, these, these Greek modes became church modes. And it's during the Gregorian, the, 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 the reign of Pope St. Gregory. And, I'm oh, sorry, was that my, yeah, there goes my, <laughs> my black microphone. All right, I gotta get this in here. <laughs> it's got a raised fourth step in the major scale. That note. That's a real go-to Hollywood film score scene, okay? You want to depict uneasy optimism? You do, you know. There go the kids into the woods, buddy. I don't know if they're ever going to come back. Okay. So, that, that's the Lydian mode. Alright, so off we go here. I know, we're going to rapidly run out of time. I hope you stick around because it's going to take a moment. What I want to do is I want you to hear the movement with no analysis of it right now. We're going to run it from beginning to end. What you're hearing on the piano for the introduction is a solo cello, that nice low string instrument. Of course it's low. And when the voices come in, it's a blues scale, and it's low in the range. Out of the depths, what is a perfect color for him to use. All right, so here's how it starts. This is the cello. Yeah, please stand. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So what I'd like to do, um, I know we just have a few minutes, so before we get into anything at all, I want to know if anyone has any questions because that might be the best way to go about this. Anyone? Any questions at all? Are you surprised at all by what you're hearing? No. That's <laughs> good. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's written a ton of stuff. He's extraordinarily successful. Yeah, it may, may be the most successful living sacred music choral composer. Yeah. I'm just curious, how was it received by the, uh, the press or the critics? It's a hit, it was, especially it was here in the United States. Yes, mm -hmm. it has sold extremely well here. Yes, and it's recognized as one of his, you know, really outstanding musical works. He's written a lot of saccharine, you know, things that have been criticized for being overly pop-oriented stuff. I know when John Hartnett was here, he just, he looked at me, because we have the donkey carol upstairs in the library. He was like, you're not doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and now this is going all over the internet. I'm so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yes. Okay. You guys can bail me out of prison. Is there a lawyer in the house? <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is now just kind of do a little bit of showing you what's going on. So look at your, look at your words, and you'll see out of the deep, the word deep is held. The note duration is much longer. And then the words award. And this is where we have the blue scale. Then he takes it up a third. Then a little later in the section, the tenors have this chromatic line. You can listen to it here. They do up a half step, down a half step, down a half step, down a half step. So right away, we have both this chromaticism and the blues thing going on at the same time. I also want you to know that when people write music, they're thinking about a lot of things. First, they have to set the text. So rhythmically, it's nice when the text declamation works out well for the singers. Um, you want, you have scales, you have the notes, the melody notes. You have harmony, that's when things happen simultaneously. Those are the chords that are either created by the four parts or by the orchestra or all of them put together like that. So we have harmonic implications. We have an important bass line there's really rooted sounds in this. The whole opening is on a low C. Big low C. Finally, when they do the blues scale, when the sopranos and tenors come in, they move it up to E flat. That's the next stopping point. And then when we get that chromaticism, you get the B flat. It's such a rooted thing. You don't even know it's there. But if you come next week and you hear it, you're going to hear that, that bass pedal stuff on the organ, and it's very, it's, it's like going to rumble through all of that, and that's important. So all the sound is built from the bottom up, especially if you're a pianist, that's something important to learn about playing the piano, is that all the sound, so it sounds more beautiful and more warm, everything's from the bottom up like that. So I like to do the opening with the choir, can you guys stand one more time? We're going to start at measure eight. <clears throat> one bar before the altos and bass is coming. <laughs> Foundation. I'll take E flat. Chromatic 
an example of what's going on. That's like, so he's structurally, that's the first section. If you look at your text, where now, if thou Lord will be extreme to mark, what is done amiss? Questioning. This is where he goes chant. The melody is totally static. You're going to have one note intoned over and over again. Just the beginning of this phrase. And then it flips back into the blues thing when the text says, Oh Lord, who may abide it? Then we get back in that blues group for that. So we're going to start right here, pick up to letter B. I'm going to play the beginning of measure 27. <laughs> This is the sopranos are just on a single note. The tempo picks up even further, and the whole thing goes up to A minor. It's like suddenly we're getting lifted out of the depths of things, and you can see that the, what the text says. So I'm going to start at letter C for the choir. Sopranos. So here's before C. see the arc of where he took this. And guess where that Hollywood moment is? Right here on the word trust. The cello does that note. That's that raised fourth. And into the blues. So he's combining those two worlds. He's toying. He's got that whole sort of you know really almost majestic type of film type scoring for this. And then it just goes right back onto the Lord. And you'll see, you're going to hear that transformation with this. Can I have the choir come in at 42 on page 16? Let's just go back. I look for the Lord. Okay, 
three, four, and. This is okay. So he he selected two psalms to be included in this requiem. So that's part of the sort of evolution of text choices, where people look. There are lots of requiems. There are thousands of requiems. Most many of them are not appropriate, at least in my opinion, for a church setting. You know, you can have the Britain War requiem, or you can have requiems about lots of other things. You know, that are not really in the more Christian tradition. He uses the 1662 Book of Common Prayer for all of the texts that would come from that, from the burial service. He uses the Psalms, uh, but he used a different translation than the one that we have in our 1982 Book of Common Prayer. And then the Mass for the Dead, which is the traditional place to go. There's plenty of texts from that, but it's not all. It's Latin and English, so he... He's mixing all of that together. So would it be used at a funeral? It would be it, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, if you had, and you'll have it next week, you'll have the complete text to everything, of course, that we're seeing next week. You'll see it. And you'll recognize those words. It, we, we, we use a more modern text sometimes, but you undoubtedly recognize it. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I 
You guys, seriously, questions? Like, is this played like all around the world or only in the US? It's played all around the world. Yeah. Yes. It's 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 uh, you need a choir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not every church has the resources that our church has. We're very lucky here that we can do music like this. Yes, sir. Um, like, is this just, like, most, like, famous song that he's done? It, it actually is not the most famous one, but it is one of the most respected works that he's written. Now, there's no question that the Requiem is a, a standout work for him. That's not just my opinion. I think it's shared. He's still alive today. Pardon me? He's still alive. He is. Yeah, he's 78 years old. 1945. Yeah. I think, did I add that right? 29 no. 79. <laughs> I think he hasn't turned 79. That's why. Yeah. Can I have a, uh, add a factoid? Yes. Um, early in his career, when he was first conducting, they did an American tour and they toured colleges all over the United States and he heard gospel choirs for the first time. Oh, and he was blown away. And they went down to the south, you know, they did all of this stuff with college choirs. And Before he wrote this. Yes. Yeah. So did you hear that, everyone? Yeah. They were half yeah. saying that he went... He went on tour before he wrote this piece right. in the United States, went to a lot of schools, and heard a lot of gospel music. And he's thinking that blues scale uh, sounded very much like a scale. It's very gospel. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. uh, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Um, a, a really energetic version of um, Down by the Riverside. Uh -huh. that it's like he set some of the spirituals and other things. He got really, really interested in that. So then it kind of came out in this. In this That's very that. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. So Catherine's just saying that his his early experience, earlier experience of touring here in the United States, going to various colleges, churches, being exposed to gospel music in person, I'm sure he knew it a little bit before he showed up, yeah. I would think, um, was you know, profoundly influential to him. It certainly turns up in the movement you heard. This is a standout like moment in this piece. Um, none of the other movements really employ this kind of sound, if you were. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes? If you will, would you mind sharing what he means to you personally? Like why you chose him? Oh, okay. Well, there's a, no, that's very... Early, like, right after he wrote this, to do this at Central We did this, since I've been here, we've done this once before, I think 2016 was when we did it. Um, yeah, there are a lot of factors that go into choosing music here. Some of it is the calendar, since, you know, Holy Week's so early, I wanted to make sure we had something we could pull together and with less fewer rehearsals, um, because the choir knows this piece well, um, and has done it before. Uh, I, 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 I think we all like the piece. I mean, I'm speaking for everyone. So it resonates for a lot of reasons. Yeah, but for, for many of the reasons that I'm you know, talking to you about, about this specifically, I admire people that can write intelligently like this, but strike emotional. And if it's not emotional, I'm like, I'm not in it. You know, it's got to have the heart. So, so that that's the first thing. And then I, I like to be surprised occasionally, like, oh, that's interesting. You know, so there's some of that too. Like this movement, I thought was a good example of something that you you know you might go, whoa, I didn't expect that in a requiem kind of thing. So yeah, those are some reasons. Like that little Lydian uh, the, mode there. The Lydian <laughs> mode, yeah. Well, what's fun about doing these types of things is it makes me work a little bit harder and dig, you know? So I can sit and look at this. There are things I didn't notice until three days ago. So, um, yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.